Thank you, Kevin, and thank you everybody for joining us today. We have, um, once again, uh, hopefully an informative webinar today, and um, uh, you'll hear from my colleague, um, Jim Ostridge, and a few, well, I guess later on in the presentation, we had to switch things around, but so, uh, you know, it's Jim, Jim Ostridge and I are um, on today, but our, our third partner of our team, Joe Tebow, is otherwise engaged with this little storm going on down in Florida. He, he does emergency management functions and he's um, otherwise engaged. So Joe, uh, um, Joe Tebow will not be with us today. So our agenda for today is um, you'll get some updates from us, but we're going to move. Uh, Captain uh, Bear Wilson is going to be up very soon. Um, he, we had to move things around because he has another commitment that he has to, has to get to. Uh, so we've moved him uh, up to second and Jim's normal uh, update is going to be later on uh, in today's agenda um, after we hear from um, Bear Wilson on from the Houston Fire Department, Captain Bear Wilson from Houston Fire Department, and then we're going to get um, an update on some pretty cool research that uh, <clears throat> Jim and I and, and several others have been involved with, uh, uh, led by uh, Battelle team um, uh, and um, on move over law and respond to safety. This was a research project that was um, uh, required of NHTSA um, by Congress. And NHTSA asked us to take this piece of, of, of a bigger, bigger thing, uh, bigger research for responder and roadside, roadside safety. Uh, the other one we're gonna, the, the last session, um, we'll, we'll talk about the, the next steps with the with the NAG, the National Unified Goal. Um, and Katie Belmore will be doing that. We, we've listed, Jim and I, but mostly um, I, I hope that Katie's able to join us by then. Uh, she's a, 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 another one that's uh, otherwise engaged engaged today. So um, with that, Kevin, why don't we go to the next slide? Oh, next month's Talking Tim. Uh, we hope to have um, Jason DeSombre. He's going to talk about Maryland's incident prediction study that uh, they're doing. So they're able to, um, you know, you know how you know you always hear from the bosses when something bad's going on. How long are you going to be? Well, uh, they've they've developed a tool that allows them to have a better idea. No one ever knows exactly how long <laughs> an incident is going to take, but they they have a um, they've done some work in this area, and they have a, a tool that helps with that. Uh, Louisiana, it, you know, it just has some success in 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 getting numbers from. Um, uh, some some unexpected source uh, um, to add to the to the um, to the Tim training numbers. So uh, we thought that that story was a um, um, pretty interesting story. So uh, we hope to have that presentation from Louisiana and um, and then uh, Oregon. We're going to have a, um, a, a an update on um, the Tim piece of a large winter event. Uh, it, it happened in Oregon. Um, I'm not sure who's going to be speaking because uh, uh, at, at this point, uh, um, for those last two segments, because there's some change in personnel. So, uh, and, and by the way, um, for November, it's talking Tim, we're going to move that to Crash Responder Safety Week, and Jim's going to talk a, a, a bit about that. It would actually occur during Thanksgiving week, and we don't want to, we don't want to, um, impact that. So we're going to uh, move it to the 14th of November. And um, I think Jim might be mentioning that later on. And then in December, we're going to also <coughs> move it up a couple of weeks to be like um, about a month after that. But I'm going to come on on those announcements. Usually it's the fourth Wednesday of every month, and we're going to be shifting that around a little bit. With that, I think I may be ready to... Um, uh, have uh, Captain Bill Wilson give us information on what's happening down there in Houston. Tim. You're muted, Bear, if you're talking and All right, I'm trying to uh, share this stuff with you guys. So just a second here. I don't think my screen's on. Is that it? Can everybody see that? There it is. Yes, sir. We got it now. You just okay, need perfect. your video. <laughs> perfect. All right. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon. I'm Bear Wilson with the Houston Fire Department. 
Uh, I am assigned to our hazardous materials response team. And uh, my, my prior life over here at the HAZMAT team, I was actually uh, assigned to our training academy and tasked with training all 4,000 members of the Houston Fire Department in the traffic incident management program. Um, so a little bit about me. I am a uh, captain on the hazardous materials team. As you can see on the right, it's a picture of my uh, here at the fire department and my, my family. On the left, also, I wear a different uniform on my days off. I work for the Harris County Sheriff's Department as well. Um, so I, I play good cop, bad fireman, or is it good fireman, bad cop? That's supposed to be a joke. Uh, so anyway, so uh, I have a little bit of knowledge on both sides of the field here. The fire service, I've been working in that for about 28, almost 29 years. Law enforcement, about nine years. Um, so we, we have a huge problem here in the Houston area. The, this, this, the county that Houston lives in is Harris County. It's 1,200 square miles. The city uh, occupies about 670 square miles of that 1,200 square miles. Um, we have 4,000 firefighters, over 95 fire stations, 95 engine companies, 40 ladder companies, and we actually interact with um, multiple law enforcement agencies, primarily the Houston Police Department, uh, state police. Uh, we have constables offices here within the area as well. Um, there's there's 90, 90 law enforcement agencies in this county, 54 fire departments. Uh, that includes Houston Fire Department, Houston PD. Uh, a lot of jurisdictional lines that cross over each other. So it, it gets really crazy. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on in the, um, in the discussion. So what we were experiencing on the fire side was extremely long on scene times for minor crashes, even crashes without injuries. And we were trying to solve a problem. We, we, we taught everybody traffic incident management on the fire side. We were getting through most of our law enforcement agencies, traffic incident management as well. And we were still experiencing these long on scene times. So I went to a counterpart at the Houston Police Department and said, we gotta, we gotta work on this. We gotta figure something out. Um, at the time he was in school. So he kind of took this on at his project. Most of what you're about to see is a document that he actually pushed through the Houston Police Department. I helped him work on it. It was it was a collaborative idea, collaborative work uh, together. So um, what we saw was Houston Police Department uh, crash reports from August 31st of 2017 through uh, August 31st, 2018, one, one year. HPD had responded to 24,000 crashes on all the major freeways. We didn't include any of the side streets, just the major freeways in that, that year span. 67,000 crashes per day on our freeways. Um, so 75% of those crashes did not involve major injury by any means. Uh, most of those uh, crashes as well, uh, the vehicles were drivable or the, the occupants could remove them from the roadway. So um, we have some other discrepancies in the data as well. A number does not include crashes that did not result in a crash report. So what does that mean? In the state of Texas, anything that it, it does damage over $1,000 um, requires a crash report. Anything under $1,000 did not require a crash report, right? So let's just say uh, somebody's driving down the road, there's a, um, uh, a tire that's blown apart and somebody hits that and might have done some damage to their vehicle. Um, that is less than $1,000 worth of damage for the most part, so it doesn't require a crash report, but it may may uh, you know blow a tire out on that vehicle that that it um, that, that impacted that tire so they're disabled in the, in the uh, lanes of travel so we wanted to remove those we have a tow and go program that's in place with uh, texas department of transportation which requires the towers to show up on scene and then to call and provide their information the vehicle's information that they're out with uh, to get authorization to remove those 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 vehicles off the roadway so as we're working on this, we decided what we would try to do is um, let's place a couple of police officers at our transportation management center that have the capability to talk to the fire trucks on the radios, but also talk to the police officers on their radios. Because here in Texas, um, there's a little state law that says that anybody that does not have police officer training 
cannot have the police officer radios, uh, radio channels in their radios. That's not saying scanners or anything like that. It just means that we can't talk back and forth with all law enforcement. Yes, yes, yes. I remember the presidential directive that says we will all inter uh, communicate, but uh, anyhow. So we wanted to, to stage these police officers at our transportation management center to try to manage this a little bit better. Um, HFDs dispatched on most of these crashes that reported unknown injuries by uh, bystanders. So basically what that does on the police side of the house is it, it lowers the priority of the call response. On the fire side of the house, we only have basically one or two calls that we respond to non-emergency. Most of our calls we respond to lights and sirens. Uh, so in the same time period, HFD was dispatched to 25,000 crashes. So we're a little bit off on our crash numbers. Um, and there again, it's because of the way the call was dropped into our uh, CAD system. Uh, what does that require? At least one engine or one ladder. We could, it could require both. Uh, are dispatched with an EMS unit to, to the crash scene, six personnel. There's about uh, 850 personnel on duty every day for the Houston Fire Department. So that's just a little, little number there in the big scheme of things. The fire truck remains on scene to manage traffic for HPD officers as the blocker. Uh, many of those vehicles involved in crashes are drivable. Citizens often decline to do so, even if the vehicle can be driven. Uh, a Houston Fire Department personnel don't have that authority to remove the vehicle. Here's the city ordinance. I'm not going to read through that. That would bore you guys. The slides will be available after uh, after the presentation. Um, so two vehicle crash. The vehicles are drivable. No injuries. HFD uh, must wait for HPD's arrival to the scene, to uh, which can take a significant amount of time. There again. Shift change, you got to change one police car over to the next uh, officer. Uh, shift briefing as well uh, played a factor in there. Um, you know, higher priority calls played a factor in this. Matter of fact, just the other day, just last week, I had a fire truck stuck on a freeway for three hours waiting on law enforcement to respond. Um, as mentioned prior, a uh, law enforcement officer has to order that move. It's, that's our city ordinance. Uh, in most cases, HPD officers' first action upon arrival is to order the, the vehicles to be towed and moved to the freeway, right? And there's even, let's go take this a step further. There's even a law in our disorderly conduct code, basically state law, that says that if a firefighter, police officer, or another authority having jurisdiction um, orders the vehicles to be removed, they shall be removed. Uh, it's a misdemeanor crime here in Texas. Most of our district attorneys don't know about it, that it's there. But uh, anyway, you know, we, we do have some, some measurements in there that uh, are supposed to help us get these vehicles off the roadway. So the issue is HFD bur burdens the baron, uh, bears the burden of the traffic control with no injury and movable crashes. Uh, this burden has resulted in at least one fire truck struck per month. Okay, so one fire truck is struck per month out there controlling traffic. Uh, average cost uh, of damage is about $70,000 to the fire trucks. Um, in addition, we've lost two fire trucks been completely totaled due to either the frame being completely bent uh, or the, the back part of the fire truck back behind the cab uh, is completely destroyed, um, you know, which results in a brand new fire truck of $450,000. Um, holding the scene increases traffic congestion in Houston, um, attempting to navigate those Houston freeways. We have three, three loops around Houston to try to navigate some of this and uh, just increases that stuff, right? Also increases the secondary uh, crashes as well. And just a little caveat here. Uh, beginning January 1st of 2023, we will actually have a secondary crash data button on our crash reports on the law enforcement side. So we're going to start collecting secondary crash data. Now that does not uh, prevent somebody from trying to create a new a report um, that doesn't link it to the primary crash as well. Okay. So there's going to be some discrepancy in that data. Um, <clears throat> how would this work? Uh, the event unfolds, HFD arrives on scene, um, no injuries exist. We would contact the HPD uh, unit working overtime at our transportation management center uh, by, by phone. And then they would turn the cameras on the crash. And then they would try to initiate a remote crash investigation, 
which once they initiated the remote crash investigation, then they can tell the, the, uh, the occupant of those crash vehicles to remove their vehicle from the roadway, or they could order a wrecker to the scene to hook up to those vehicles and remove them from the roadway. Okay. Uh, at the location, the HFD supervisor will notify or will use his city phone to, to make uh, that contact, but also to take pictures. We advise them to take about five to six pictures of the crash scene uh, and then email those to the um, to the, the overtime officers at the Transportation Management Center so they had some good documentation of the scene. Okay. Um, it, you know, so there's some, some issues that popped up in this, right? Some of the um, occupants didn't want to talk to a police officer remotely. They wanted to talk to them in person. Uh, firefighters were worried about some of the liability issues. We'll talk about those here in a second as well. Um, and so basically, once it's authorized by the remote officers, we'd move them to an alternate location, basically your, your local uh, stop and rob, your Home Depot, movie theater, parking lot, whatever it may be, something from the main lanes of travel to get that traffic back open again. And then, then those occupants of the crash vehicles would sit there and wait for an officer to respond non-emergency to complete the, the crash report, or the remote uh, officer could actually conduct that uh, remote investigation and get all the paperwork done remotely, email all the, the paperwork to the, um, to the occupants as well. Um, so only time the HB unit would be needed on scene is if there's some additional on scene action, maybe some additional citations written, maybe somebody has some rest warrants out there, whatever it may be. Uh, I'm sorry, we changed the city ordinance to express this pilot program um, and allow this to happen that we could remotely authorize that record driver and uh, with the HFD supervisor calling the remote officers as well. Um, HFD and HPD proposed a six month pilot program. This was actually funded on a grant from our Texas Department of Transportation. Um, it would utilize two HPD officers on two different shifts. So we looked at 0500 to 1100 in the morning, heaviest uh, day uh, flow times of traffic. And then from about 1500 to 2100 in the afternoon, uh, there again, heaviest uh, traffic periods of the day, Monday through Friday, um, each shift would have at least one HF, I'm sorry, that was supposed to be one HPD sergeant and one HPD officer uh, at that transportation management center. HFD would deploy smartphones in the highest volume crash locations. So basically what we did is we looked at all 95 fire stations and uh, we took the top uh, engines and the top ladder companies that, that respond to these type of crashes. Uh, it ended up being, if I'm not mistaken, off the top of my head, uh, 23 different fire stations, and um, and we deployed those phones. We did a little bit of training with each each shift uh, and each crew on how to use the phone, what we expected when they showed up on scene, and then uh, uh, said go. So here's a picture of our city. Basically, all the uh, the colored in areas is, is the city of Houston. It's 60 miles east to west and about 70 miles north to south. Um, so huge distances, great distances here. Uh, these are the fire stations that were involved um, as I have them outlined there. Um, so you can see some of the outlying areas didn't have it. Uh, and it was basically the closer to the center of the city, we, we experienced the highest you know, crash volumes there. Um, what was our purpose of this program was to increase the responder safety by reducing on scene time, improve crash clearance goals, um, enhance our interagency cooperation and uh, relationships, decrease the response times to those incidents, reduce our incident duration, reduce associated congestion, reduce our cost and risk exposure to the citizens, reduce the risk of secondary crashes, and enhance fire and police response efficiency as well. Um, so when we proposed all of this, that's, that's where our, our, our main bullet points there. Um, we ran this program and uh, we had to stop because of COVID. Then we relaunched the program in August of, I'm sorry, September of 2020 and ran it until the end of January 21. Um, and in the first month, we had 75 crashes that qualified our criteria. So I mentioned we have 60, on average, 67 crashes per day on our freeways, but only 75 qualified for our program. 
Uh, two, two citizens out of that 75 actually complied. Uh, most citizens told our fire supervisors uh, that their insurance company told them not to move the vehicles from the roadway. Uh, we also heard our attorneys told us not to move these vehicles from the roadway unless law enforcement was on scene and they didn't consider a remote investigator as law enforcement on scene. Uh, and of course, you know, I told our fire uh, supervisors that were there, I said, don't, don't get any kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, physical contact or anything like that with these people. Um, we had an issue with our wrecker uh, drivers as well. They didn't listen to the HFD supervisors, obviously, because there was a city ordinance that said that they could only take orders to hook up to these vehicles with, uh, with law enforcement present. Um, HFD supervisors were worried about the liability. They were worried that, you know, hey, look, you know, what if this person's intoxicated? I tell them to move their vehicle uh, or if they're intoxicated and a record driver hooks up and then tows them to some other location other than what we've noted, uh, would that come back on me? Um, the HFD supervisors weren't trained in what is appropriate uh, insurance, you know, fake documentation. Uh, what if some of these uh, drivers did not have any type of insurance, all that kind of stuff, they were worried about that liability coming back on them. Uh, a lot of times what we ran into is citizens didn't provide correct information. They had, uh, you know, fake driver's license or out of country driver's license, didn't have appropriate insurance, stuff like that. Um, so th these were a lot of our, our, our issues that, that faced us. Uh, ultimately, the, the program failed. Uh, I'll be honest, it failed. It was a, uh, it was a disappointment on our, on, on, I think everybody that was involved, HPD, the Houston fire department as well. Uh, we really wanted to, um, it, it really wanted this to, to be successful. Um, so it, it ends up now that we've, as I mentioned, I still have a fire truck that's waiting on scene at times for over, uh, over three hours. Um, and, and a lot of that has to do with jurisdictional boundaries. You know, the crash happened in the city, but now the crash actually stops in the county jurisdiction or the crash happened in the county and now they stopped in the city jurisdiction. And uh, who's going to respond to that? And it just keeps going back and forth. It makes it makes it uh, an issue. One of the biggest successes we found out of this is we need uh, we need to staff our transportation management center. It, it helps with the coordination so much better um, as I as I you know, some of the things that, that, that plagued us along with this is, uh, you know, Joe Q citizen uh, was maybe a little bit more forthcoming with the fire department than what they were law enforcement due to maybe some prior histories uh, with law enforcement. Uh, one of the other things that popped up was um, uh, HPD might have received the call information at one location, but the Houston Fire Department received it at another. As the 911 call taker was taking in the information, it updated the Houston Fire Department call slip uh, or incident number, but they didn't update the Houston Police Department uh, incident. So we felt that we needed to staff the Transportation Management Center together, sitting next to each other and being able to, to handle those calls. Uh, we, we wanted uniform personnel at those locations. And, um, you know, un unfortunately, the, the, the pilot program failed. And so we weren't able to get that. But we identified the, the, these needs here. So um, anyway, I have a little bit of time for some questions and answers after this. Uh, anybody have any questions for me? I think I see some in the yes. chat here. Yeah, we have some questions. Um, so um, I, I know the question, I think people don't understand you're, you're, you're from the fire department, although they should. <laughs> Does Houston have SSP, you know, safety service patrol units? I, I know the answer, but Captain, do you? Yes. Uh, so the city of Houston, the city of Houston went and, and they've actually hired um, um, civilian personnel as uh, part of our transportation management program to go out and occupy the space of a police officer blocking lanes of traffic. Um, however, those uh, those people get called to many different uh, locations every day. You know, I didn't include the the, the street level traffic uh, uh, incidents or the city street traffic incidents uh, on there. And so they're going they're bouncing all around the city. We do have a countywide program that's operated by the county sheriff's department. 
and uh, they only uh, occupy the freeways from uh, one time to the next. Of course, they're out on disabled vehicles. They're out, they're out assisting crashes as well. Maybe somebody who's run out of gas, maybe somebody who has a flat tire. Um, and, and there's only a certain amount of those people as well uh, that are out there. Um, so uh, yes, we do. It's not as robust as we would like for it to be, but, uh, but, it, but it does help out a little bit. Yeah. There is one. Yeah, there is. Yeah. Uh, another question, um, Captain, it does, um, John McClellan, uh, does the law mean you can't verbally instruct the driver to remove the vehicle to the shoulder? Um, or is it that you can't order a tow truck um, for a non-drivable vehicle? So um, we, we have a very unique system here with our, our towing system. Um, there's over... Uh, 900 towing license within the city. There's about another 700 towing license in the county. Um, I cannot order a tow truck to move the vehicle over to the shoulder at all uh, as a firefighter. If I have my firefighter uniform on, uh, it has to be law enforcement personnel. And there's some history with that. Uh, just the, the, the Reader's Digest version, best uh, um, Best thing I can I can tell you is that law enforcement takes inventory of the vehicle. They assure the inventory will be there when it gets to the storage yard. If a firefighter did that, um, you know he, he doesn't have that authority to take uh, inventory or even possession of anything within the vehicle. So uh, that's that's probably the biggest the easiest way to explain that. Okay, thanks. Uh, another one. Um, we're all of your. Um, a Houston Fire Department struck by incidents and to the National Struck by Database, which you may not be aware of. Are you aware of that new struck by database that we have? No, sir, I am not. Now, here's here's the um, here's the, the the next big issue. I'm one cog in the wheel, right? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Uh, I don't get notified of all of these uh, these incidents. Uh, typically, it's somebody on a fire truck that may notify me, or I read it on the news the next day. Um, uh, you know, with, we're, we run over a thousand calls in a 24 hour period um, and, and about 50 percent of our calls ended up being crashes. That's on city streets and the freeways of both. So, um, yeah, it's, it's I'm sorry, not 50 percent, 28 percent. I'm sorry, 28 percent of those. So, yeah, I, I, I don't I haven't re, uh, reported those to that particular website. And I, I don't know if the data would be accurate. Yeah, so yeah, we're just um, making people aware that it, it's just recently stood up in the last six or nine months or something like that. But um, yeah, if there was any way to get the data struck by date information, we're we're trying to we're trying to get not with fatalities, but we're trying to get injuries and also vehicles struck would be a pretty good number to have um, or information to have on that. And I know you have to get going, but one more. Well, we already answered that one. And then Todd Lace had a couple of questions. Uh, what did Todd have asked there? Uh, someone else asked me, Kevin. What did Todd ask, Kevin? What did... Uh, Todd was pointing out that his were answered. He was asking about oh. law enforcement offer, officer oh. on the scene needing to authorize the removal. Yeah. I see it now. Okay. I received a text from a firefighter close calls yesterday. Only after two weeks, a Texas fire department's blocking truck was hit and protect, but protected 12 first responders. Yeah. So one of the things that we've proposed out of this program as well was uh, blocking apparatus. Um, so we want to take old apparatus and uh, put them in a fire station, uh, one per quadrant and then have that fire station respond out as a blocking apparatus to prevent those fire trucks. Uh, we talked about filling it um, with sand. I know that's been an idea that's passed around on these calls and, and within the fire community. Uh, one of the big things that came up uh, when I was talking to one of the fire truck manufacturers was the, the tank that the water went in hasn't been tested or rated with sand put in it. Uh, and the truck hasn't been tested or, or rated or even weighed with sand putting in it, uh, put in the tank as well. So there were some things in there that, that we hadn't worked out. We didn't feel comfortable working out uh, as far as the city's concerned uh, to, to, to transform those old fire trucks into a blocking apparatus. 
We're looking at some alternative ideas as well out there. Uh, yes, that is something we want to do. Um, we're just, uh, I'm a one man show with this big, big, and I, my full time job is, is, is a, a captain on our hazmat team. So you know how those things work out. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, captain, thanks very much. We'll, we'll let you move on to your next meeting that I know you're already late to. Uh, thank you so much for uh, always uh, have interesting perspectives on things uh, and what's happening down there in Texas and your own assessment is uh, always appreciated. So um, thank you, sir. Anytime. I appreciate uh, I appreciate uh, all your help and, and y'all's guidance as well. This program's was very successful for the Houston Fire Department traffic traffic incident management. It was very successful for the Houston Fire Department in reducing our our, uh, our own vehicle collisions on our average response time, uh, our response days. And so um, I just, uh, we appreciate it. Any way we can give back, we always try to. So thank you. Excellent, thanks again, Bear. So next up is, um, is our contractor team that had done this research on um, uh, move over law efficacy. Uh, we started that research. We don't. We, we still are just starting the, down that path uh, on how how um, how effective is the move, are the move over laws in this country. Um, but but we, we 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 took a step in the positive direction. Also, research on um, responder and other roadside worker technology. Um, three presenters from that contractor team. Um, we're going to have Alessandro Sanchez, who will be, um, uh, has um, more than 18 years of experience in research and technology and transportation. He is a, a transportation engineer with Patel, conducting research and developing technology solutions for public and private sector, including US DOT multi, uh, modal administration funded products. Bob, Bob Kreil is a senior data scientist from Battelle. He is a um, subject matter expert on uh, stati statistical and analysis, modeling, and es estimation. Um, he has supported uh, government agencies and commercial firms um, in, uh, in, with design of collection through survey instruments, observational studies, and planned experiments. And then the third presenter is, um, so this is uh, University of Maryland Cat Lab uh, is, um, is a um, sub on this, is uh, Roddy Moscow has uh, 20 years of experience, will be presenting um, on, on that, on their piece of the observational study, um, but he has 20 years of experience um, providing project uh, management, technical development over the public sector. Uh, he is currently executive director of the University of Maryland's Kaplan program, very uh, well-known and uh, very uh, sophisticated program, which provides more mobile software to first responders designed to improve communications data and incident response. Long introduction there. Um, so we will um, let um, Alessandro take it over. Thanks, Alessandro. Thank you, thank you, Paul. Can you see the presentation? Coming up, now we can, yes, sir. Okay, well, thank you so much. So uh, yeah, so we, we are currently conducting this research uh, is the responder and other roadside worker safety research. Um, so let's, let's start. A little, a little uh, background on this project. Uh, the uh, Congress tasked the National Highway Tra Traffic Safety Administration to conduct a study on the effectiveness of of several technologies intended to improve safety for incident responders and roadside workers. Uh, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration is working with uh, FHWA, conducting a comprehensive data-driven assessment of policies, practices, and technologies uh, aimed at improving the safety of incident responders and roadside workers. The, uh, this assessment focuses on move over low compliance and the effectiveness of technologies that have been designed to improve safety. So what is the move over law? Uh, the move over law is a traffic safety law that requires drivers to change lanes or slow down when approaching stopped emergency vehicles, such as police, fire, ambulances, and in some states, DOT vehicles, uh, tow trucks, and also any vehicle that is stopped on the side of the road with their hazard lights on. Uh, the purpose of this law is to reduce the likelihood of responders being struck while working on the side of the road and uh, by providing a safety buffer between the vehicles and the responders. All 50 states have a version of this move over law implemented. 
However, uh, traffic incidents continue to be a, a leading cause of, of death of, of, uh, for on-duty officers and, and roadside workers. The purpose for the project is to understand the, the moveover compliance and technology base struck by crash countermeasures. Uh, assess driver compliance with moveover law by uh, conducting a data-driven assessment of the moveover laws in the United States and also identify factors that are likely to influence driver compliance. Uh, we were uh, tasked to develop and execute an observational research effort to understand factors that influence driver comp comp uh, compliance, assess technology countermeasures by identifying current and emerging technologies that influence uh, roadside worker safety, and uh, assess uh, the perceived efficacy of roadside safety technologies. And the result of this study is going to be provided to, to Congress. So the methodology for this project is, is, is a multi-stage effort that, that's comprised of, of several literature reviews and data gathering activities uh, to ensure we have the, the most up-to-date information about the state of the practice. Um, using the information that we gathered, the, the team uh, conducted an observational study to assess move over law compliance. And, uh, and we also uh, had agency interviews to identify technologies that are actively deployed or are currently being considered uh, to improve worker safety. The, we also sent out a technology checklist to all the FHWA field offices to better understand uh, the use of, of roadside worker and, and responder safety technology. And um, uh, the following uh, uh, three or four slides are, it's a summary of, 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 the, of the first, uh, the first task, task, which is the state of the practice. So um, the Emergency Responder Safety Institute's struck by database uh, reports that in 2021, there were a total of 65 struck by crashes that resulted in a fatality. Uh, the, this data, while is very valuable, it doesn't cover the totality of incidents since it's, it comes from media reports and, and is not uh, done by standardized mechanisms. But an important finding is that a uh, large number of fatalities occurred during the, the day that involved driving distractions and poor driving behaviors, such as speeding, tailgating, and, and failing to move over. Uh, the common factors that influence works on crash severity includes uh, works on location, the time of day, and the activity type. The odds of serious injuries for works on crashes are higher during non-peak hours and greater for workers on foot as opposed to workers in a vehicle. And overall, the statistics suggest that struck by crashes tend to occur in daylight and in clear weather predominantly. Um, as part of this project, we summarized each of the state's move over law and found that these laws uh, vary highly from state to state. Uh, every state incorporates a speed reduction statute. In some cases, they provide a specific mile per hour reduction in speed, but in others, it leaves it up to the driver to select a safe speed. There's also uh, fines uh, which vary from $25 for a first violation up to $10,000 for injuring or killing a responder or worker. Um, some of some states assign points against a driver's license, which vary from two points to five points. Some states do not specify the number of points that, that are going to be added to the license. They, they just mentioned this. And in some cases, the, there's a mention of a driver license suspension. Um, uh, some states incorporate uh, jail time for repeat offenses and for injuring or killing a responder or worker. And the jail time can vary from seven days up to up to one year. Uh, there are several factors that influence move over compliance. Uh, driver distraction is identified as, as a major cause of move over law violations. Drivers uh, crash into incident scenes or work zones due to completing a secondary uh, task, such as uh, looking at their cell phone or interacting with uh, in vehicle systems or other activities. Uh, there's also lack of awareness of this legislation, which is it's very important. Um, a survey that was conducted by the National Safety Council found that 34% of drivers have never heard of, 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 of move over laws. Uh, factors that have shown to increase move over compliance are um, high visibility uh, workers garment and also high visibility uh, equipment. Um, a study showed that drivers are more likely to comply with move over laws if a law enforcement vehicle is present at the, right, at the roadside with flashing their red, uh, their red and blues also, uh, the number of drivers slow down and move over 
uh, the number was high when there were signs reminding of, of a fine if, 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 the law, if the law was violated. Also, the studies shown that uh, the messages that contain phrases such as move over, slow down, or uh, move over is the law uh, associated with reductions in, in speed and increased compliance as opposed to move to uh, signs that only uh, mentioned that uh, there was a, a work zone ahead. So this is just a quick summary of, 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 uh, of, of, our, of our background research into understanding the move over compliance, the loss, and the factors that, are, that, that contribute to the compliance of this law. Uh, now I'm going to pass it over to Bob, who is going to present a summary of, of the observational study that we conducted for, for this project. Alejandro. I will talk about the move over observational study that we conducted. Uh, this was a field study that entailed passive observation of some naturally occurring incident scenes over about a, uh, a little over a year. Uh, and from the data that we collected on in this study, we were able to come up with uh, move over law compliance estimates and also to do some statistical modeling to determine which factors uh, appeared to correlate uh, best with. Uh, with compliance. Next slide. The video that was used for the study were, were collected between uh, February 2021 and May of 2022. Uh, they do represent live incident scene videos from transportation organizations uh, who provided those as partners of, in this research. And from those videos entailed a total of eight different states uh, listed here on the slide. Uh, and a total of 68 different incident scenes uh, through which about 33,000 vehicles uh, drove through those uh, videos uh, during those incident uh, scene times. Uh, the study team developed a uh, tool called the Object Detection and Tracking Algorithm, or ODT, that was capable of processing those videos, tagging all the vehicles, uh, uh, traversing the videos, and identifying whether those uh, in individual vehicles uh, either moved over or, or slowed down. Uh, the first step of that ODT algorithm would uh, identify whether a vehicle was subject to the move over law. Uh, in other words, whether it was in a lane adjacent to the one where the incident was occurring. So many vehicles are not subject to move over law strictly um, in, if they're not in that adjacent lane. And then uh, the ODT algorithm is further able to differentiate uh, whether or not vehicles that were in the subject to the law moved over uh, at least one lane, uh, or alternatively, most laws uh, provide for a provision that if you cannot move over, do not feel you can safely move over, that you can slow down as well. And so you can meet compliance either by uh, moving over or by slowing down. The uh, slowdown number isn't a prescribed number in most state laws. Uh, we therefore tried to use a standardized value that seemed reasonable. Uh, in this case, the algorithm is tuned to 20%. So a reduction of 20% would, would be identified for those vehicles. Next slide. So we calculated two primary measures for move over compliance. The first measure uh, was whether a vehicle either moved over or slowed down at least 20%. So if a vehicle meet, met either one of those conditions, it was considered to be compliant with the move over law. Uh, then we also processed the data through a secondary measure, which required move over only. Uh, also because of what I said previously about the laws vary from state to state and the slowdown percentage is more of a subjective standard. Uh, so we have a, we also process the data looking specifically at move over only. The final number of vehicles that uh, traversed the video incidents that we looked at was 7,831, which were judged to be subject to move over law out of the 33,000 total vehicles. And then we looked at estimating some differential compliance rates uh, and, and uncertainty bounds for those as well uh, by several important factors. So we looked at cars versus trucks. Uh, we looked at rural versus urban roadways. We looked at different incident types, whether it was a crash scene or just a disabled. Uh, we looked at responder scene types, whether there's police or safety service or both uh, on scene. And then we also had a traffic flow measure, which we calculated. Uh, base, uh, which was the number of vehicles per lane per minute at that scene. Next slide. 
our overall uh, evaluation results at the aggregate level across all the eight states and all the uh, in individual incidents was 49% compliance uh, by move over or, or speed reduction and 37% compliance by move over only. Uh, so those numbers uh, are the total overall result from the ent entirety of the events in the study. We broke those results down by cars versus trucks. We were finding higher compliance for trucks uh, for move over or slow down uh, or for move over only either measure. Uh, truck compliance was about 6% higher, 53.7 versus 47 uh, for move over or slow down, and it was about 8% higher, 42.5 to 34.7 uh, for move over only. As I said, uh, th those compliance numbers for trucks, uh, about seven to 8% higher than what we saw for cars, uh, led to an overall uh, statistically significant result that trucks were more likely to comply with the move over law. I'll point out that there is the statistics that I'm citing here are uh, at the 50% compliance level. And that's a there's a statistical reason for these results, uh, the percentage of compliance differences uh, are going to be different between the low end and the high end of compliance overall in the study. Uh, as you get closer to 0% or 100% compliance, the differences between classes get smaller. Uh, so I'm reporting the maximum numbers, which are those that occur at about 50% compliance. The second important uh, outcome from this study was that we looked at the uh, vehicles that were on scene. Uh, we looked at when we saw that there were police and safety service patrol presence on the scene, we found a statistically significantly higher compliance rate than when you had only one or the other. So police uh, relative to safety, police and safety service relative to just safety service or police and safety service relative to just police. So when you add that additional presence, it increased the move over or slow down compliance. That's what that's meeting the compliance by either measure by about 11%. Uh, the conclusion from that is that the larger number of incident responders um, uh, or roadside workers on the scene uh, appears to have an effect of, of, of making drivers either more uh, willing to a move over or slow down or maybe more uh, cognizant of the scene in the first place. Uh, and able to recognize that they need to do so. I said previously that we also looked at move over only compliance, and this was one particular category uh, where the outcome uh, was had a significant result in one direction. So when there was safety service patrol presence initially at a scene, and then police came on the scene, the overall uh, move over compliance is 24% higher uh, for strictly moving over than the compliance when the safety service patrol alone is on, on the scene. Uh, and the uh, conclusion that we took from that is that the police specifically are more likely to lead drivers to uh, specifically choose to move over as opposed to slowing down uh, in order to meet that compliance. And then the final uh, statistically significant result that we saw from th these incidents uh, has to do with the congestion. So we evaluated the number of vehicles per lane per minute at these scenes. It varied anywhere from two to 41 across the incidents that we looked at. Uh, the statistical modeling showed that an increase of one vehicle in the congestion measure, one vehicle per lane per minute was associated with a 2% drop in compliance. So if you went from 10 to 11 vehicles or 20 to 21 vehicles uh, per lane per minute, that would correspond to about a 2% drop in compliance. Uh, and that leads to an overall conclusion that increases in congestion are leading to a reduced uh, move over compliance, uh, possibly because drivers are less likely to move over with uh, and more congestion, uh, although they still should slow down. In addition to those factors where we did find significant results, there were several where we did not find any significant correlation. So the rural versus urban roadways didn't show any significant difference. Time of day and day of week didn't show any significant difference. Uh, and event type of disabled vehicle versus crash didn't show any significant difference. 
Now that doesn't mean that there were not or there are not differences there. Uh, it just means within the context of the data that we collected and analyzed, we were not able to observe any differences uh, for those factors. Additionally, there were some factors that we were unable to uh, evaluate in our model due to uh, not having enough uh, uh, passive observations that occurred. So we include initially included weather as a potential factor, but the road conditions were nearly always clear for the videos that we had. So there was insufficient data to uh, evaluate whether or not uh, there's a specific impact associated with weather. And then the incident scenes themselves, uh, we were also only able to evaluate those which were provided. There were very limited uh, instances where we were provided video that include either fire or EMS on site. So as I previously talked about police and service patrol presence, uh, the reason that those were evaluated specifically is that the, that's what was available in the videos. And then the final limitation I want to point out with this study is that the uh, 68 videos that we took, although they represent, as far as we know, uh, the largest such study of uh, passive move over law compliance, uh, they still are not, should not be considered nationally representative uh, because they don't cover off all geographies and all roadways and they were not collected in a, a random sampling uh, uh, framework. Uh, and, then, and then the final limitation on, that's important in the study is that we were not uh, able to evaluate any specific uh, measures from the drivers themselves as far as intent. Uh, so we may see that there's a correlation between whether or not drover, drivers moved over or slowed down, but we can't uh, evaluate intent from that. And that concludes uh, what I have to talk about. I'd like to turn it over to Roddy now. Thanks, Bob. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, technology assessment and some success stories that, that came out of the study uh, to date. So uh, I know we're running a little long here, but let me just go through a few of these slides uh, quickly. But one of the things we wanted to do um, was conduct an assessment <clears throat> that included a market scan, um, uh, basically a deep dive literature review, as well as some more in-depth conversations uh, with key stakeholders uh, representing uh, many different organizations, uh, as many as we possibly could, um, to get a good representative sample nationally. Um, and our focus was to consider technologies that uh, would demonstrate an increase um, to safety, specifically to responders and other roadside workers. Um, and one of the considerations was uh, technologies that would require um, some minimal additional equipment, um, relatively small form factor, though that doesn't apply to everything that we looked at. Uh, and of course, importantly, does not interfere with uh, the actual task of responders and roadside worker duties. Uh, so the technologies that uh, we focused on included positive protection, and that includes physical barriers, um, uh, advances in sequential flares and lighting, and that includes uh, newer technologies, LED, um, lighting that can synchronize uh, themselves, um, uh, connected vehicle alerts. There's uh, a, a big advance recently in the use and capabilities of, of alerts that can come directly from responder vehicles. Um, equipment that also has the ability to send electronic alerts that can be consumed uh, by multiple recipients, uh, including you know, the smart cones. Um, improvements in wearable uh, apparel and lighting uh, to make it more visible to motorists, uh, uh, for people, responders, and roadside workers who are on scene, um, and other connected wearable safety devices. Um, much of the research, of course, and literature that's out there and the market scans that we uh, pursued, of course, focus on work zone applications. Um, there's some general lack of, uh, of, of a lot of information related to the use uh, for incident management, but uh, there is more and more um, technology that is being used to support uh, TIM as well as first responders specifically that falls into these categories. So there, there is some coming there. It's just not as much as what we have for work zones to date. So some of the technologies that everyone's familiar with are wearable devices, and that includes some connected devices, 
um, some that provide greater visibility, but also the sequential flashing lights. And um, you'll see in the positive protection image up there, there's you know, very large mobile barriers um, uh, that can be provided uh, to incident scenes and work zones, um, work zones primarily, but also certain incident scenes. Um, and the advent of the connected warnings and technologies are, are really, um, really coming into their own uh, these days. And then finally, a, a little image of the sequential flares that uh, I'm sure people are, are seeing and using more frequently. So the trends um, that were identified based on the literature review, the market scan and, and conversation with stakeholders. Um, you know, there's a, a use of traditional uh, pyrotechnic flares, some positive protection and advanced technologies that are taking place um, in work zones where there's a, a bit more time to plan for the use of multiple technologies. Um, but there's also been a significant increase in the use of connected devices uh, that can provide real time uh, information on the status of uh, what is taking place on the roadway, whether it's a work zone and in some cases in Tim as well. Um, Positive protection, of course, is, is heavily uh, liked, uh, although that provides uh, a challenge, a unique challenge, because uh, there are uh, cumbersome nature of that and um, special vehicles that are trailers specifically that are needed to, to move some positive protection devices into the field, but they are very well liked. Um, five agencies had, uh, that we spoke to directly had mentioned that they had tried uh, work zone intrusion alarms. Um, but that they did not find them uh, terribly useful in every instance. There was a, a common theme of, of false positives. Um, in other cases, inadequate warning times. Um, it, there was a sense that there was not it was not necessarily useful in every scenario uh, or in various scenarios, which limited their benefit. Um, and of course, there were some uh, references to the the technical limitations, uh, electrical capacity of some vehicles. Um, that that are required, uh, the, the technologies that are required can and overpower certain vehicles, that those are considerations that need to be uh, thought through. So success stories, we defined um, uh, the conversations that we've had where people have identified very positive responses um, within the organizations, as well as uh, from the general public in some cases. Uh, and uh, we've identified those as success stories. And, and one of the first ones we want to talk about is the vehicle alerting. Um, there are many agencies that have been uh, deploying alert technologies that are notifying automatically upstream drivers uh, that they are approaching a work zone or an incident scene. Uh, and this is uh, the, the nice thing about these is they're relatively uh, easy to, to install. Some OEMs are, and vehicle OEMs are actually building these technologies and alert technologies in, and they are automatic in the nature, uh, by nature of them uh, activating uh, by virtue of the emergency lights. Um, they can be transmitted again um, very, very easily. Uh, and in certain cases, um, PTC, there was uh, over 4.5 million alerts that were transmitted. Uh, some of these can be uh, customizable alerts that provide a little bit more information to the upstream drivers in their smartphones uh, to give them a bit more information about uh, what the incident or, um, or the work zone is that they are approaching and which lanes that might be uh, taken up and, and provide additional direction, um, which is a bit more specific than a standard move over message. Uh, and then, of course, reference a couple other jurisdictions we spoke to um, that have uh, deployed similar solutions, including Colorado, Missouri, and North Texas Toll Authority. So synchronized lighting technologies, there's been a, um, a number of agencies that have reported successes in, in taking advantage of computerized uh, synchronized uh, lighting, and that includes flares, but also lighting on the vehicles. Um, it, we have a great opportunity to, to leverage some of the lighting technologies that are out there that uh, companies are developing that, that can synchronize across vehicles, uh, not just across the devices automatically, and provide patterns that, that provide or enable motorists to have, in a sense, more visual clarity um, about what is uh, the situation that they are approaching, whether it's a work zone or an incident, and uh, even see visual direction uh, regarding which way they should be moving over in those particular instances. Um, uh, in Colorado, the Department of Transportation has uh, synchronized lighting across multiple snow plows uh, so that when they are in operation, they appear as almost a single uh, visual cue 
um, and visual alert to motorists so they can see exactly in, in better detail um, visually but what they are approaching when they see a plow, a group of plows that are operating um, together. Um, Illinois State Police has implement, implemented some customized lighting patterns um, that they believe are, are is definitely resulting in some improved motorist uh, awareness and behavior. And those are dynamic and they uh, can change patterns based on speed and response type and, and physical location. So th there's a lot of capability that is now coming into lighting that, that we think uh, warrants uh, some greater attention and, and provides some opportunity. Mobile barriers, so um, uh, uh, unlike the others, which can be automatic and, and small in form factor and easy to deploy, mobile barriers, of course, are more challenging, uh, as mentioned, uh, but they provide a, a pretty important physical separation. Uh, typical deployments, as mentioned before, are work zones, but for long duration incidents, crash reconstruction, um, some jurisdictions are deploying those. Um, again, they're cumbersome, but they provide uh, extra benefits, not just the physical separation between those, uh, the responder and the, or the roadside worker, but they also eliminate some degree of rubbernecking uh, due to um, the, the fact that the motorists who are passing uh, cannot visually see uh, what is being either worked on or responded to. Uh, so the, the, there's a general positive response to these physical barriers. Um, the biggest considerations and limitations of these is that they are cumbersome. They're uh, also expensive, um, but that so that is the primary consideration there. But the reports are very positive for their use. Um, and I'll wrap up next steps. Uh, the, the, what we're going to be doing next is providing uh, the results of the study to uh, Congress, and which will be shared nationally. Um, and so we're working right now on finalizing a series of reports that will be made um, available to all. Um, we're going to work on a, a more in-depth uh, webinar that talks a little bit more about the effectiveness and the results uh, looking at later this year, early next year. Um, and some additional analysis uh, we, we think will be needed to assess the efficacy of the practices and technologies um, to look at move over law compliance. And, and the laws, of course, are evolving. Um, uh, we're here at the university in, in Maryland. We, we, um, we are changing our law in the state effective actually this Saturday. Um, we're going to be requiring the law in Maryland, uh, like in other jurisdictions, is, is, been, is being updated so that any vehicle um, at all that is parked or has any kind of warning lights, including regular vehicle hazard lights, will require move over action or a speed reduction uh, by passing motorists. So uh, there, are, there are big opportunities, I think, to look at how some of those evolutions of the, of the statutes uh, are changing uh, motorist behavior and, and seeing the results there. So. And with that, I think we are wrapped up. Paul? Thanks, Roddy. Nice presentation uh, by all. Thanks, Roddy and, and, um, and the other presenters as well. Um, there was a couple of questions, but um, I think we're, we're <clears throat> running a little late, so we're gonna, gonna keep moving if that's all right. Well, maybe we can respond in the chat. Um, you know, th this, this we're just starting down that path of uh, whether you know the move over, how effective the move over laws are, and I think they are effective, right? It looks like they are effective, even if half the people are moving over, that's effective. Um, the technology piece, I think, has a lot of promise. Where um, you know, there's there's increasingly what we found is uh, it is an increasing um, this there's an evolving uh, and emerging. Uh, technology that can be used um, more and more to help respond because that's what I think is really needed is 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 some sort of technology that protects uh, the roadside workers you know including responders as well so um, with that I think we'll switch over in um, and and uh, in, in, um, gonna have Jim um, you're gonna do your slides next um, and then we'll, we'll get to the nug conversation correct Mr. Ostrich Okay, Paul, thank you. And definitely great presentations uh, by Bear, uh, Houston Fire, and uh, the Battelle Volpe team on uh, very important research, move over laws and struck bys. Uh, so, and, and delighted to see that we still have 102 participates on the participants on the call today. So very quickly, everybody uh, uh, 
applaud, yell, scream, jump up and down or whatever, because yeah. <laughs> you see that number down there, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, there is there is a catch, but it's a it's a great catch, and uh, I want to uh, talk uh, a little bit about that for sure. Uh, but no, it's it's it it's because we know we've been in the rears uh, on the training numbers. Paul, Joe, and I, and our team has always said uh, that we're in the rears. This uh, this number could actually be in seven hundred thousand plus in reality, um, if, if truth be known. But regardless, um, kudos to all of you and um, keep up the awesome work. Yeah, Jim? Yeah. Yeah, not exactly in the rears, right? Nothing on our end. It's, we don't get all the numbers, right? Well, that, we get, yes, Paul, yeah. thank you. That, that's what I mean by in the rears, that trainers, yeah. individual trainers, Academies uh, and and others are not uploading their numbers, their training numbers. Thanks I had a, a state just recently. Jim told me they they have seven or eight sessions. I haven't had a chance to get to, to upload, and so uh, we know what's happening. We just don't want you to forget. Make sure you upload. Um, so sorry. Exactly. Jim. Yeah. Exactly. Thanks, Paul. Uh, next slide. So the. Am I controlling? Because I tried to move that slide and it did not. Let's see. Okay. Um, the tail of the tape right now for re responders struck by line of duty deaths. I will say this is as of uh, the 24th of August. Uh, I don't know uh, how many are sadly in the pipeline for September. Uh, well, there, Todd, Todd reported. Uh, thank you, Todd, from Pennsylvania. I figured there was at least two more that would be coming. Thanks, John. John Sullivan, uh, Tennessee. That was Todd Lease from uh, Pennsylvania. Um, so, but of course, as we always say, one is too many, right? And, and, and we'll, you know, are we able to one day uh, make this zero, make this a zero. The good news is uh, at this point last year, we were at approximately 50, 51. So that's, that's positive. Uh, but we still have three months uh, left in the year. Uh, and it sure would be wonderful to not get anywhere near that 65 number uh, that you heard earlier. Um, it's just a tragic situation. And as we always say, you know, we have no clue on the injuries. And as you heard Bear Wilson, Captain Wilson mentioned, you know, the vehicle strikes and, and all of that that could, could have been, you know, uh, fatal, you know, fatalities and injuries, you know, oh my gosh. So, Anyway, uh, please keep promoting the training. Uh, as our colleague Joe Tebow, we says, uh, Tim saves lives, and we all believe that. Next slide. So the the I included all the slides today just because I like to do that every once in a while. Uh, Katie Belmore with HNTB, and the Battelle team, and and others work very hard. Uh, uh, compiling all the data, maintaining all the, all the statistics for us. And uh, here you see the trained trainer sessions thus far since the summer of 2012, 528. And there are, as we reported last, last month, uh, some trainer, trainer sessions coming up in the weeks and months ahead. So uh, it's your chance to deepen your bench, widen your bench, however you want to say it. <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, to train uh, others uh, in your state, uh, send them to the train to train there. Do try to, do try to uh, uh, find people that have experience training, we always say, uh, and also that have already taken the four-hour course and are really committed to training. That's, that's one of the things we step, stipulate in the announcement. Next slide. 
is uh, the total nationally of uh, the trainers, uh, almost 14,000. I won't harp on the fact that the majority are not training, but it's a sad fact. Uh, and of course, that those few that we suspect that are training and haven't reported, that's that's something that for sure is, is going on, as we said. Next slide is the map showing the, uh, the in-person training uh, added to the uh, web-based training from Emergency Responder Safety Institute, Emergency uh, Responder Safety Learning Network, our friends there, um, and of course the National Highway Institute and a couple of other states, Ohio being one of them that has uh, uh, their own customized uh, online training in Pennsylvania too, as a matter of fact. So um, we're on that march, don't forget. Next slide will show you that I think is the, uh, next slide please. Yeah, this this map here showing the uh, the percentage of uh, where states have uh, achieved their uh, their goal of responder population to be trained, which is the number in parentheses below. Um, but that march that I mentioned to over a million plus, well over a million in reality, I I believe that really this number is closer to two million. Um, personally, but in the lower left, you see that number and uh, all the states, uh, the progress they're making uh, to try to get uh, their populations trained. So uh, if you have influence, if you're a part of a, a state uh, committee, Tim committee, that includes a Tim coordinator, a Tim training coordinator, I should say, um, and if you don't consider one, because this, we're finding that the states that are lagging behind, uh, that are just not able to produce, you know, our training, the, you know, produce or uh, conduct four hour training sessions, it's either, you know, they, they don't have the trainers, the trainers that they've graduated, like we said, are not producing. Uh, and that's why you need to consider, you know, graduating some new trainers but also the fact that uh, uh, maybe there just is an interest. I, I don't know. I, I, I struggle with this because we, Paul, Joe, and I, our office, it's, this is our hallmark program, one of them for sure, the training, right? And remember, when we started, to do, started out on this quest back in the summer of 2012, we had no goal really to, to, to train over well over a million. It was a much, 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 much smaller number, but here we are, and it's all thanks to you. But we, we still got to, you know, keep going here. Um, next slide. This is the bar chart, obviously showing the, the progress for the different law, you know, disciplines. Uh, and we are going to be targeting, I will say, as part of this quick mentions here on this slide uh, and already started our, our uh, colleague, Joe Tebow, brother, uh, 44 plus years in the fire service, uh, paramedic. Um, he's recently engaged the uh, EMS community, emergency medical services com uh, community uh, in uh, an attempt to try to <clears throat> or connect with the um, state EMS directors, thanks to Dia Gaynor, who's the executive director of NASEMSO, the National EMS, um, State EMS Officials uh, Association, um, and maybe doing that uh, with towing recovery and some of the others as well, uh, because we're, we're really thinking out of the box as much as we can on how we can continue to push uh, the, the training. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, this shows the progress, as you can see, from the last report to, to this report. 
and uh, state by state. Next slide. And don't forget all the presentations, all the slides, everything will be on the National Operations Center of Excellence website within the next couple of weeks, as Kevin Vita mentioned. This is the top 10 states. And there you have, here I want to talk real quick of what happened in Louisiana. It's, it's imperative. Paul, Joe, and I were asking you to, to take a look at this because this is a big deal, okay? Uh, Lieutenant Robert Mills, Louisiana State Police, an old friend of ours, uh, just recently uh, retired from state police and uh, was picked up by a, a Serco, I don't think it hurts to say, Serco is a big engineering firm in the state. And they hired Lieutenant Mills, Robert, to be the statewide coordinator. Robert took it upon himself, being law enforcement, to, to dig, dig deep into, you know, what's going on with the numbers, uh, the training, Tim training in Louisiana. And he found that on the law enforcement side, Officers that are in service, because the POST, uh, which stands for Peace Officer or Police Officer Standards and Training, they're the agency for Louisiana, they had mandated the training for all in-service police officers. And so come to find out, Robert confirmed that since 2014, all the way through 20. 18, I think it is, um, there were, uh, I believe, close to 16,000 uh, officers um, uh, between all the agencies, um, police agencies, that is, that had been trained, and those numbers had, ne had not been reported. And so Katie Belmore uh, worked with um, Lieutenant Mills, Robert, uh, to confirm all of this. And that's what gave us this huge jump that you see right there and brought us to that new total of six, 615,000. Now think about it just for a second. How, how, many, how many other scenarios like that could there be across you know, our great nation? 50, you know, 50 states, DC and Puerto Rico, I just challenge you and ask you to, to like, look, take a look at this. This also included the numbers from the academies from Louisiana, um, state police and others. And so this is a very, very big deal, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I fell out of my chair when I learned about this and uh, about three weeks ago. And it's just amazing, so. Jim, do you mind if I chime in there? Please do, uh, Catherine. Yeah, I just wanted to mention, um, we did use a conservative number. We're continuing to work with uh, Robert. So um, you might see another big jump like that from Louisiana. Um, but I, I'm here at the Oregon Tim Conference today, and I was talking to David McDonald, and I just wanted to point out, if it wasn't for Louisiana, we would be praising Texas right now, if you look at their big jump. Um, and it kind of was the same thing. They had San Antonio um, every two years they have to do training and they incorporated the training into that requirement and train their entire agency. So they had this huge entry of, you know, it was like 16 or 1700. So I just wanted to point out like Louisiana did awesome. At the same time, Texas did a pretty great thing too. So I just wanted Absolutely. to mention that today. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. And if Donald or David's on from uh, Texas, the statewide coordinator, coordinator Dave McDonald, uh, virtual hugs, David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, he's, um, at he's at the conference. So oh, he's at the conference now. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, but I will pass that along, Jim, for sure. Thank you. Give him a hug. Give him a hug from Jim. <laughs> Okay. That's right. A triple hug, Paul, Joe, and Jim. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, next slide yeah. is uh, Crash Responder Safety Week, CRSW, all together now, everybody, CRSW, Crash Responder Week, the second week of November every year. Do not forget, this should be indelibly marked in all our brains. Uh, 
and uh, one where we commemorate and honor responders, our fallen brothers and sisters, and all those that are still out there serving um, the public. Uh, one, a theme for every day of the week, as you see here, the primary theme on Monday, uh, November 14th, I failed to put the date up there, but we've shared this before, and you'll see the flyer in a minute, November 14th through the 18th, and uh, you can see the, well, I started to say the primary theme, respect our roadside heroes, and then on Tuesday, we're training, slow down, move over, more than a crash, and in a big one, uh, Friday driver education. We're still hoping and praying to do an event at, at DOT headquarters, our first in-person event at headquarters with various states uh, on scene uh, with responders and vehicles and uh, high-level executives from the major public safety associations and uh, uh, it's, a, it's a big deal, folks. And there, on Monday as well, with Shali Shah, who's our communication and marketing contractor extraordinaire, also leading that contract, uh, is putting together again another uh, kickoff webinar on Monday the 14th, which you uh, stay tuned. You'll be getting uh, the information about the webinar and, you know, let let 10 of your friends know in, in, in your uh, uh, circle of trust because uh, it's, it's just going to be an amazing, uh, another proclamation signing, virtual proclamation signing. And there's just so much more uh, that we could talk about. Uh, next slide is the flyer, I believe, that is going to be coming your way. And you can see there the date. And you know, the three topics that are mentioned there, your story needs to be heard, play your part, and become a CRSW champion. And with that, uh, Paul, you, you need to mention anything there? Uh, nope, nope. Just, uh, uh, um, I, I am just eternally grateful that we finally reached 600 because Jim, Jim was getting aggravated each week, each week we were reaching 600,000. <laughs> so we went over that number. I, I was so happy for all of us, but Jim, especially. So Katie, what do you think? Do we have time to review the, um, the nugget all we, we, um, you know, we, we went a little long. We had some shift in, uh, in, in agendas today. Um, what do you My think? thought is to call it Audible and, and move it to the next one, just because I, I don't think there's any way we could get people onto Mentimeter in five minutes. Oh, oh that's true. Yeah. We'll come um, so I'd, I'd yeah. like to get there and, you know, make sure we get input. So um, yeah. if that's OK, I think we can defer defer to next month. Yeah. Jim, will you, you agree? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm good yeah. with that, Paul, and I apologize for going along. So no, we had some good news to share, Jim. So I, I appreciate yeah. that. No, and yeah. I, I think I think it's important. So right, if, if Louisiana didn't didn't dig up the you know the Texas had Texas had big numbers and and there was others, you know, even even um this is what every two weeks uh, this report, right? Um so you know, like there was some several states in that up in that chart that um you know 200 couple of several states with 200 so uh don't minimize those other states right but but you know those other texas and louisiana big big numbers uh this, this month so that's 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 really really cool but um, for sure yeah so we yeah those are yeah even a couple of hundred a month is is still still respectable that the idea is to keep on keep on training and keep on sending us the numbers so yeah with that, um, I don't know that we had any questions that we could answer, Jim. Um, I saw comments. I didn't. Uh, yeah, mostly comments. And um, yeah, I do. I'll just say, Paul, since we still have five minutes, you saw okay. Lee. Uh, I think it was Lee Perry, Utah. Uh, mentioned yeah, Lee, Lee Perry, yeah. Yeah, mentioned uh, during uh, CRSW, State of Utah is doing a uh, uh, train to trainer. Uh, and that the 15th, the uh, theme of the day on Tuesday is Tim training. So keep that in mind, ladies and gentlemen. Arizona and other states in the past have 
really uh, ramped up training uh, during that special week. And um, Jim, what David, else? David Strawn, uh, you did say that there was a flyer. The flyer is available now. David is asking um, the CRSW flyer. Is that is that available? Yeah. The, it, it is, but it's it has to be, it, we're going to disseminate it in the next week. Uh, we got a couple more steps to do. David, thank you for asking. We'll make sure you get it. And don't get us started about those steps, but that's a whole nother story. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, the online train the trainers as well there that I mentioned, John from Tennessee is asking. Uh, there, the announcement is being prepared, and we're going to push that out to the to the national Tim community as well. Uh, so, as soon as you get it, make sure you have your people lined up. Remember, experienced trainers. You want to maximize the the return on investment. Yeah, experienced and those that will have um, the flexibility to train, the authority from their bosses to train. There you go. Thanks. See the note from Lee, Salt Lake City on the 15th. That's when they're doing it. Yeah. Oh, the proclamations. We're up to, I think it's 18 states, which is up six from last year. Uh, so kudos to everybody that's working on a Tim, you know, the proclamation for CRSW. You get a lot of, uh, a lot of mileage out of those and we long for the day where there's a proclamation for all 50 states dc and puerto rico so thank you for that okay paul back to you yeah i, I think we're good a lot of good comments in there we don't read them all to you our friend angela put a put a from arizona has put some um, stuff on there helping drive that uh, to program in arizona but anyways um Hey, thanks everybody. Sorry we didn't get to everything, but we I thought they were all really good presentations. And um, we'll see you next month. And uh, I'm not sure if we'll, we'll probably squeeze in the nug, the nug conversation, the continued nug conversation. Uh, we have some recommendations for your input. Um, so see you next month. And um, as usual, stay safe out there. Thanks and for Paul. all you do. Yes, Jim. Yeah, for sure, Paul. And pray for Florida, folks. Uh, Puerto Rico, too. All the, yeah. the suffering and everything that's coming. Uh, already been to Florida and all those other islands and, and now the great state of Florida. It's not, not pretty. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.